What we're going to talk about today this, for the next 30 minutes real quickly is capturing and sharing knowledge people to people. And we're going to kind of cover some of the techniques that are available or that are currently being used by the organization. Come on guys, let's go. Hurry it up. I see you coming in. Come on, let's go. <laughs> so you know, I um, where I come from, if you're late for a meeting, you get locked out. <laughs> and you have to buy donuts the next time for everybody. <laughs> All right? So we're going to lock the doors, put a sign up there so you've got to buy donuts for everybody in lunch, right? 30 minutes is 30 minutes. All right? Wine in the evening. Yes, I like that better yet. Lots of wine. Hundreds of dollars worth of wine in the evening. All right. All right, so now the knowledge iceberg, I think you've seen this before, right? We say 10% of the knowledge is explicit. It's kind of what we know, which is already kind of written. And then, and then that's our data, our documents, our records, our files. And then 90% and then is tacit knowledge, and that's our experiences, our thinking, our competency. Now you could argue that could be maybe an 80-20, a 90-10, 25-75, but it goes back to that, that, that the Lominger FYI book. It says 70% experiential, right? How do you transfer that? Well, you really can't. I mean, we have, well, not yet at least. We haven't gotten the robots down, but we're back to the robot example, right? So you have to give people an opportunity to experience it. We learn by experiencing it. That's just the way we are as humans. Um, and so we, what we think we see on top of the iceberg, there's so much more underneath. And so that's our challenge with knowledge management. How do you get people to understand that and recognize that? And so why is it important? We've already talked about this, right? Retiring workforce, the growing need for clean energy. We, again, we were clean before clean was popular. All right, guys coming in, I'm going to remind you again, 30 minutes is 30 minutes. All right? And if the last person in is going to have to buy, uh, we said wine for everybody, right? 30 minutes, it's going to be you. <laughs> All right. And then there's an expanding role of nuclear power in the world. Not necessarily in the United States, but there's expanding, uh, they're expanding uh, the role of nuclear power. Um, so this is the latest data from the, uh, the uh, Nuclear Energy Institute of the U.S. industry and this was data as of December uh, 2016. And we started doing this survey um, literally in 2003, uh, 2003. So this is 13 years worth of demographic data. I don't think I've ever seen a study ever in any industry that tracks the demographics for 13 years. But I want you to look at the curvature of what we look like in the United States industry, in a lot of our workforce between 43 and 52, now, 13 years later, look at this sort of gold bar, and you can see that that 38 to 42, 33 to 52, has dropped from here to here. Look at that drop of knowledge. And then look at the growth here, right? So the wave is moving to the right. Mother Nature is winning. How about that? Nobody's figured out how to stop Mother Nature. And so the challenge is that dip in the center, right? The knowledge, there's lack of mid-career professionals in our industry. This graphic is very, is very similar to what I've seen in China um, and what I've heard uh, that, is, that is going on in, in, a, in, uh, in Europe. And so we are, we are uh, changing or aging our organization and industry. But we're starting to normalize. Instead of a bell-shaped curve, it's becoming kind of a flatter curve over time. You've seen that happen. But we are forming another bubble back here on the back end. Okay, so we have a knowledge and experience bubble going on. We're not going to have enough mid-career professionals. These people that are, that are in red and in purple, they have 10 years of service or less in the industry. Look at this. That's almost half. Almost half the U.S. industry is less than 10 years of service today. And now you know why the U.S. industry is challenged in some of its performance. 
So approaches to knowledge uh, sharing and capturing. So I'm not going to go through these in a, in a lot of detail because I think you guys can find this out. But there's documents that talk about that, right? It's historical knowledge. What, what's the important historical knowledge that we have to have? What sort of job task knowledge do we have to have? What sort of predictions do we have to have? Sources of information, uh, our expert versus novice, and how do we get it out? Do we interview, self-elicitation, do we write it down, do we, do we tape them? So it, the approaches vary, um, but the approach that works the best, and you heard some of our experts talk about, is storytelling. So some of the best strategies you can put in place is to have these experts share their story with as many people as possible, right? I mean, the storytelling has been going on for thousands and thousands of years, right? The caveman, you know, my, my dad, the caveman, we used to write it on the walls of hieroglyphics, right? Those are storytelling. What makes you think that we're any smarter than those people were? They, got, they didn't have the written word as we have today, right? They, they, all they had were pictures and stories. And so that methodology continues to work because the way our, our brains are, are biologically wired. I share this with you because all the things that you have, at the end of the day, it's about the stories that they tell and the experiences that they share. So approaches, and these are just, you know, it's competency, means knowledge plus skill plus attitude because people are repositories of knowledge. So it's people to people transfer. So there's Albert Einstein trying to try to transfer it to me. It's not working. Albert's dead. I'm not hearing very many stories from him. But you get the idea. So the approaches, and you've seen this before. The question is what is the specific knowledge I need to capture? Not all knowledge needs to be captured. I cannot stress this enough. If you start the process and say, I have to identify all the knowledge in, in my organization, you're going to try to boil the ocean. You know what that term means, boil the ocean? You can't boil the ocean, right? You can't, it isn't going to happen. You have to understand what is the critical knowledge that, that I have to have. So the so what? What's the consequences of the loss of that knowledge? I got 30 years of HR, nuclear HR experience. The, la the first 20 years of that, who cares? It's the last 10 years that's probably more relevant. They're locking us in, they don't want us to leave. And now what do I want to do about it? Okay, I understand I got critical knowledge. I understand it might be unique knowledge, right? Remember, if it's critical but not unique, do we care about it? Because a lot of people have it. And the answer is we do care if not enough people have it. And then now what do we do about it? So critical knowledge is what's important to the organization is covered in the risk management of knowledge loss presentation. And I covered that with you guys a little bit earlier. So I'm going to share this with you. I'd love to tell you that I developed this, but I didn't. I just took it from somebody. Um, there's different methodologies for transferring knowledge. The, the, the most inefficient methodology, but the easiest methodology, is self-obtained knowledge, right? That's where somebody goes out and they read procedures, guides, right? Uh, there's discussion boards, right? Those don't take as much time, but they're not necessarily the most efficient forms of knowledge. The next one is you know, learning from others, your corrective action programs. Uh, performance improvement programs, you're learning from, from history, you're reading about it. The next uh, one, which takes more time and more effort, is getting involved with community of practices, employee networks. These are that networks that, the, that the, our colleagues talked about earlier, right? Establishing these neural networks and these knowledge networks and you're sharing experiences. But the best method to transfer knowledge is to take your newest employee, be it an engineer or scientist, and tell them you want them to teach a topic to their peers. Boy, let me tell you, they start to sweat, they get nervous, they have to research it, they have to talk to the experts, they have to practice it, they have to make sure what they're talking about is accurate, 
and they're learning at a very exponential pace. Guess what you guys are doing on Friday? <laughs> you're, you're the guinea pigs. You're going to be telling us something you're learning. And as much as you hate that process, it will help you and it will benefit you. So that's, the, that's why they, we do it. Peer teaching, teaching others, right? Being part of that sort of, and being, being physical, physical and, and present in front of somebody, making them tell their story, right? And people, some people hate telling their story, right? But that's the most important piece. And once sometimes somebody starts telling you their story, they just don't shut up. But that's okay. Record it. All right, the dynamic learning, this is, uh, these are just different sort of examples of another method using, you know, um, these, this is using technology. These are um, uh, glass top simulators, simulating a control room. Anybody who runs an NPP anymore has these things. I don't think anybody does it anymore. They're, they're almost, you know, the only standard in terms of, of, uh, of learning. And so, um, these are things like computerized, uh, utilized classroom, computer-based training. Uh, the trainers are experienced sort of operators and technicians. Sometimes you use retirees. Again, this is only going to get you about 30% there. So these are examples of dynamic learning classes, management cert classes, plant systems classes, things you use to help you know, teach the knowledge. Peer teams. Uh, peer teams our uh, community of practices uh, is an example I shared with you yesterday where there's these employee affinity groups or peer teams. Uh, governance uh, peer teams, I won't go through all of this because of time. Community of practice, this is an example of the community of practice structure. And the reason um, I want to cover this one, this is the community of practice that I manage. So what I do now is I manage the community of practice for North America for all HR and organizational effectiveness practitioners, completely funded and supported by the industry. And this is where uh, people like my, people like me, you know, dinosaurs, no, not all dinosaurs, um, come together um, and we share best practices and we have our community of practice. So one of the, one of the professors spoke earlier you've got to get out in industry and you've got, to, you've got to benchmark and you've got to get out and share best practices and socialize and, and establish your networks, right? And we use the Nuclear Human Resources Group, that's the name of the organization, to do that for, for North America. And so the committees here, are, these are just top examples, labor, total rewards, knowledge management, workforce planning, talent acquisition, and, and organizational effectiveness are the type of subjects that, that they focus on. Um, there are other sort of NEI um, uh, groups um, out there, configuration management, equipment reliability, supply chain, IT, asset management, licensing, fire protection, work management. Those are some of the peer communities that exist in the North American industry in the NPP. And in your country, or in your organization, these are very valuable networks and they're cheap to operate because they're self-funded and they're done by the organization. But it allows you to bring in like peers across the industry to share best practices and work on, on problems. And so, just to give you an idea, the HR one um, follows the, um, uh, the, the standard performance model that was put together by NEI many years ago. Um, this is the, uh, the process map for HR and all the different things that are covered in human resources uh, out of that process. This came out of the, the community of practice, the different sort of things that you've got to do in HR and, and sort of uh, topics to cover. Um, I won't go through too much of this one. This is the difference in coaching and mentoring. So somebody asked a question earlier about mentoring. Mentoring is about developing skills. Coaching is about teaching skills. So when do you coach and when do you mentor? Because you need them both, right? Sometimes your leader is your coach and your peer is your mentor. <laughs> so things to think about is coaching is about goal focus. What are you trying to get to? Mentoring is about personal development. Coaching is tactical. 
specific for the moment, like a football coach, how to get something done in football. Mentoring is more strategic. Uh, coaching is more tangible, you know, something specific, where mentoring is more visionary. And then coaching tends to be short term, or mentoring tends to be long term. So just, you can take a picture of this. It's, it's going to be on the um, CLP format. You can grab this, and you can kind of think this through a little bit for your organization. Um, so I want you to watch this video. I'm going to show you a video. I'm going to show you some interns, right? But I want you to think about what's the key messages you hear in this video from the interns. I want you to listen very carefully to it. It is in English, so I apologize. It's in Western slang English. How does it relate to the company standards and expectations, safety standards? What knowledge management tools are being used by the interns? What are they using? What tools are they using? Was it, did they talk about explicit or tacit knowledge? And what do you think some of your key learnings were from, from this that you walked away with? Now, these are interns. They've only been with the organization for a summer. These are summer interns. They've only been in the organization two months. Two months. I want you to kind of look at this and tell me what you think. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Maxwell, and I am here with a group of interns who have been working on a design equivalency chain for the condensate storage tank behind Unit 1 this summer. Hey, Zeus, can you tell me a little bit more about what the problem is that your group has been working on? Sure. So like you said, we're working on a design equivalency change. Now, specifically, our project deals with three of the six building blocks off of the leadership model pyramid. Plant equipment, problem identification and resolution, and safety. With that said, we're wanting to do, replace our current soft seat uh, valve to a metal seat valve, which is typically called a hard seat. Uh, the reason we wanted to do this is to incre increase the reliability of the whole system. Awesome. Thanks, Jesus. Raldi, can you tell me a little bit about why this project is so important at Palo Verde? Absolutely. So as Jesus mentioned, uh, the equipment we're working on is directly related to the reliability of the safety system, which is a condensate storage tank. If we, if we reference the uh, standards expectations book on page 22, we see that the condensate storage tank is the top of the risk matrix as far as the equipment of the service goes. So we want to make sure that these safety systems are reliable and will work properly whenever we need them. Uh, by changing uh, the salt city valve with the hard, uh, hard metal city valve, we increase the reliability of the system, we decrease the maintenance cost, and just in general, we increase the, the lifespan of that equipment. That's awesome. It sounds like you guys are doing a lot of great work here this summer at Palo Verde. I'm here again with two interns from the same group who have been working on the design equivalency change on the condensate storage tank behind Unit 1, and this is Jesse and Tiffany. Jesse, can you tell me a little bit more about how your group solved this problem? Sure. Well, originally, Alan Hartway gave us this project um, for our group, and it had to do with the valves, and we know nothing about valves whatsoever. So the first thing we had to do was get a crash course in that, and Ron Kropp actually helped us with that. He, he knows pretty much everything about them, and he basically just gave us this hour-long lecture telling us about everything. From there, uh, we made a list of vendors. We had 37 different vendors that we, we looked up. And the, originally, they all told us, yeah, we, we, can, we can get you this kind of valve with a hard seat. And after we told them we needed an end stamp with that hard seat, we only really got three people that said that we could actually do that. So narrowing it down from there, we were able to find which one of them met our tech specs uh, better than any of them. We actually had a comparison um, in our DEC. And uh, we were able to pick a, a Veer valve, um, and it's pretty much overkill of what we need, but it's the best thing we have. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Jesse. So, Tiffany, can you tell me a little bit more about how it feels to be a part of this group here at Powell Verde, and how you enjoyed working here this summer? Well, it was an excellent opportunity to work with two electricals and another mechanical engineering major. It was great to have the opportunity to network with, uh, with industry names such as Ron Kropp. We got to have the experience of meeting with Alan Hartwig, seeing what the whole process of writing a DEC is about. And overall, it was extraordinary to be able to be a part of something that would help better Palo Verde and the Southwest. It's a, it's a great opportunity to help Palo Verde safely and efficiently generate electricity for the long term. All right. so. 
you heard these interns. This is, they've only been on the job two months, and, they, and they're working through a problem. So what do you think some of the key messages were in the video? Anybody? What you walk? What do you think they, their messages were? What do you think they walked away with? Yes, sir. They show that they they could uh, teach the, the interns to do a great job, and use some tools to to make the the learning process make better. They use uh, formal education, uh, objective uh, on doing, and after the interview, help them probably to to learn more and be prepared to speak to the interviewer. So the message to me is that, that the process was okay. They they learned it. They learned it. Okay, back there. I think for me one of the key. Um, uh, aspects that I noticed is that the interns were actually assigned a task. You know, mm. they were given a project to carry out. Uh, most times, interns come into a company, they just sit behind the desk. Empty the trash, clean yeah. the toilet. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, in yeah. this case, they were actually assigned a, a, a big project, you know, yeah. something very important to do. And they learn from that. We got in the back there. She's, she's been having her hand raised. Um, actually, this uh, video showed me the the, a proof for the numbers you gave us that 10 percent only we learn at universities or in classes so the the basic and the effective learning is in practice in practice yeah yeah right there well actually there are a lot of key messages one can infer from the uh, interview first and foremost we can we will find out that the interns are being uh, cultured in, 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 in such a way that they will imbibe the corporate culture of reliability and safety, as well as um, a, a, a sort of a economic uh, uh, policy of uh, cost reduction by trying to replace the soft seal with a hard seal so as to improve reliability and then also reduce frequent cost of uh, uh, OPEX, OPEX in terms of maintenance. Then we can also infer that they have been introduced to some uh, sort of uh, um, safety design methodology, which they call design equivalency change, yeah. which actually is also part of trying to uh, 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 bring them into the corporate culture of the organization. These are some of the few things one can deduce. Yeah. All right, so those are all right. Those are all uh, the message. Now, I'm, I don't have too much time because of time, but let's go to the knowledge management tools that were used by the interns. What, what do you think were the key knowledge management tools the interns used in this video? Mentor. They, had a mentor. they had a mentor. But what did the interns do? What tools did the interns use for knowledge management? They what? They found documentation, they did research, right? Yes. Primary research to get information. Internalization. They internalized it. They interviewed, right? Did they do some interviewing of, of experts, right? They talked to people, so there was a collaboration. They worked as a team, right? I promise you, those four students, some of those who got employed, those, some of those engineers were employed by, by, by the company later on, they learned about hard seat valves, which they knew nothing about. And now they, they, they understand it. So they were deploying knowledge management tools to not even realize it. They didn't come to this class. But their mentors and their education helped them understand how to do what they needed to do to be successful in their career. Okay? So there were some things too. If you notice, I, I won't cover too much. They, went, they, they took some tacit knowledge that were in the expert's head, I'm sorry, um, ex tacit knowledge in the expert's head, and they made it explicit, right? They interviewed the experts, and they wrote down some information to do the research they needed, right? So remember, they, did, so they, were, they, were going, they were practicing knowledge management techniques by taking tacit to explicit knowledge. I show you this video only 
as a real life example, this is not staged, we didn't give them a script. This is something um, uh, to two purposes. Something that will help you as you're working on your internship programs, as you're thinking about your knowledge management programs, you've got to give these interns something specific to do with the defined deliverable task. And through that process, they have to be following your guidance documents, your corporate documents, right? They have to follow within the, the safety guidelines. So you ought to make sure those elements are all included. So in summary, knowledge is experience. Everything else is information. And I didn't write this. This is from Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Einstein himself. So. The part of knowledge management is how do you get the experiences based on the foundational knowledge. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Any questions? A couple questions or comments? No?